All right, so let's, um, it's been about four minutes. I think we can get started from here. Um, if you guys can see me and hear me just fine, put a one in the comments so I know that um, that everything is working as designed. Okay, cool. Now, you've already found the comment box, so that is great. Since this is just a Zoom, a regular Zoom um, connection, like a like a video call, there isn't going to be a question box, I don't believe. So if you have a question that you are burning to ask, and then I missed it because the chat box goes really quick, or sometimes I just move the chat box off my screen because it's going so fast I can't think properly, then um, save your answer or save your question, copy and paste it onto a notepad or write it down somewhere and ask at the end, because at the end of this, we're going to have a Q&A. So uh, we have an agenda. We're going to go over a few things today, and then we are going to um, have a pretty open and inclusive Q&A. And it kind of depends on you guys how formal we stick this. If the group stays small, like under 50, then I think we're just going to uh, let our hair down and have a good chat about NFTs and art and art business. Um, and we'll see how the tone goes from there. But because this is a regular NFT, of <laughs> net regular, a regular webinar call, um, we are going to, we're in a Zoom. So I need you guys to stay on mute. There is a hand raise feature, some, excuse me, somewhere. I think it's on the chat bar at the bottom. There's a, a place for you to raise your hand if you have something to, a question to ask. And we're gonna save that till the end. When you raise your hand, I'll bring you up on stage. And so your video will come on and we can have a conversation and you can ask your question and I can use Zoom to, to answer whatever it is that is burning in your heart to be answered. Um, but other than that, stay on mute and use the chat box to communicate with me or with Luann, who is also pinned at the top. And then she can relay anything to me that is extra super important. Um, and so that's about it for, for house cleaning stuff. Let me just clean up my screen a little bit more. And I think we can go from there. Now, in the original webinar, there was a POAP, a proof of participation. So everybody who's here should have gotten an email when they registered for the original webinar that had their download goodies, okay? If you got that, put a one in the box, right? Put a yes in the box so that I know you did. But if you didn't, there were directions in there to how you could how you'd be able to claim this. Now, because this is that was for the original webinar, what I have instead is a big list of links that you can go and, and use to claim your own um, POAP. So uh, I will drop that list of links here at the end. Denise, you sent me a message to me directly. So you want to make sure when you click on the message button that you have it listed to everyone and then it'll it'll show up in the feed and it'll also be public so that if this, when I make this into a video, when it goes out, the chat feed will go alongside of it. Yep, you got it. All right. We have 30 people in here. Pretty cool. 27 because I, I've already disappointed someone. So, all right, let's go. Uh, okay, so you guys are here. And I'm gonna breeze through these, but if you agree with any of these, or if you're here for a different reason, then go ahead and put that in the box too, because helping me understand why you're here will help me craft this material so that you understand it. But basically, I think the predominant reason why most people come to my webinars is that they've been working on their art for a long time and they're not being rewarded or you're not being rewarded for, for the work that you are doing. And I'll tell you that a lot of that is simply in marketing, right? And a lot of it is how do you get in front of the right collectors? And the NFT market, I can tell you without any equivocation, gives you this opportunity to get in front of the right people like you've never had the opportunity before. So um, so that's one. You're here in the right place if you've heard about Victorian and the blockchain, which I'm assuming all of you guys have. And, um, and if you don't want to get left behind by this new trend, okay? I don't think this blockchain thing, this NFT world market is going to go away. And I have I have some proof to share with you about why and how um, and who else believes that. So that's a thing. And I, I imagine that you're here if you don't know where to get started. So again, use that chat box. Let me know if there's something that you guys are here for that I am not touching on. Um, and you can always just type a yes, no, one, two, three, four uh, into the comments 
to let me know if we're sort of on the same page. Now, if you make art of any sort, if you are a sculptor, I see Heather Sprague's background, looks like it might be a piece of her art. Uh, I see this heart thing behind Joe. If you make art of any sort, whether it's a painting, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a sculpture, and you take a photograph of it, and if you turn it into a digital presentation piece, then you can sell it in the NFT market. Okay, the NFT market allows you to add a digital provenance and a history to your work. And um, if you take a picture of it, you can do it. So if you do found object sculptures that you pick up, you know, trash from the beach and you turn it into a horse and you sell it for half a million dollars, you can also do that as an NFT. Okay. So I hope that if you guys are here, that um, you are going to keep an open mind about these things. And we're going to get into some of the, the details about uh, all of the things you might've heard about NFTs and all of the things that I think you actually need to know in order to get started. So a little bit about me and some of the, the whole, who am I thing. So um, th these things you see here, you know, I don't like to read my slides verbatim, but basically I've been doing art since 2012. And some of you are here are probably much older than me and have been doing it for longer. I started art in 2006. I started art full-time in 2014. And in between I had been working up to that. And I, I kind of really dug in in 2012. And since then, since about 2015, I've been doing the whole six figure a year thing. I gave a TED talk on my work. Um, I, I wrote a book I published in 2020. It, it was a six year project, but I finished it during COVID. Um, I have a master's in organizational leadership, which is like an MBA plus a psychology degree. I was in the Air Force. So that's a little bit about me, but I think what is important is that I'm here to help. And this whole forum that I'm using to help you guys and to, to help artists is called the Artist Selling Art, which is a platform and a membership to help artists uh, launch with help into the marketing world and into selling their art and to help you refine the product that you build, right? To help you take your raw talent and turn it into a product that people can buy and put on their walls. So that's what I've been doing for the last four years now, since 2018 in addition to, well, almost as secondary to running my own art business. So I am a working artist first. And I think if any of you join this course or follow me along, um, that you will, um, yeah. hey, I need you to mute yourself or I'll mute you, but yeah, guys, stay muted. So, um, so yeah, I've been doing this for about four years, teaching and helping artists. And uh, I've always done it as a piece of what I'm already doing. So I learned something, I bring it to you. And that's pretty much the, the rhythm of my life since 2018. So um, let's get into it. Okay, I'm sure you guys are ready to get into it. I'm sure it's late for you. And, um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to just hearing your guys' thoughts and bringing some of you into this new space. I'm looking through the names right now. And there's a few names I recognize, like Lydia, um, Tom, uh, I, you know, Heather, I think we've spoke before. I don't know. Maybe we haven't. Deborah's here. Um, that's cool. So if you guys actually, Deborah's was, is a full member of the Artist Selling Art, <clears throat> but she made the money to join by attending my last webinar, doing what I told everyone to do. And then she earned a bunch of money and then joined the full thing. So um, Deborah, I'm going to pin you up to the top two, whether you like it or not. Or oh, actually, I don't think I can do it until you turn on your camera. But um, yeah, if you if Deborah answers any of your questions, then um, you can know that she's got a fair amount of experience to, to share with everyone. So NFTs are dead. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to move this over, I think. This is a lot different than doing it on a webinar platform. So some of these chat boxes are just in inconvenient places. Now, NFTs are dead. Now, this is something that I'm sure all of you guys have heard, right? Like you can raise your hand if you're on camera or you can type a one in the chat box or yes, if you've heard this idea that NFTs are dead. And that is a expansion on what is really happening, which is we are in a bear market or a bear cycle in the crypto world. And just like a bear cycle in the regular NFT space or the regular fiat world with the stock market and the NIC and the S&P 500, if we were in a bear market in dollars, I wouldn't tell you to stop selling your art. 
I wouldn't say cash is dead. No one's buying art. Go home, go find some other job to do in, in a bear market somehow. Right. I wouldn't say that. And I don't say that for NFTs. We are in a bear market cycle. And honestly, when you see this chart slide that I have coming up, this is the best time to be starting in NFTs, right? So when I do this webinar again and we're in a full-on bull swing, I'm going to be like, well, you guys are hearing a great deal. You have a lot of work to catch up on because the people who are here first, the people who are here during the bear market are the ones who are already established. And that's what I want and I want for you. All you guys is to start establishing yourself in the NFT uh, art ecosphere. So the other thing we're going to talk about is are NFTs bad for the environment? And I know you guys have heard this a lot, so I am going to break this down in a way that's a little bit more understandable than kilowatt hours and national energy consumption rates. So NFTs are, NFTs are dead. Wells Fargo, and I'm sure everyone here has heard of Wells Fargo, had published this on August 6th. And they said that digital assets, which an NFT is a digital asset, are assets are inventions on par or innovations on par with the internet, with this thing that we're all communicating on, with cars and with electricity. And this is, I, I want you to imagine your world, but in a digital space, right? And some of you are, uh, what are your guys' ages? So I'm 36. If you guys are older than younger, you can type an O or a Y than that. Like I saw a Joe smile because I'm like a child in his eyes, right? Um, so I'm 36, but so imagine, like I, I live in this loft, I have all this stuff, right? But then this digital world comes to life and I get to participate in this digital world. But when I get there, I have nothing. Like I end up in a digital empty space that someone else built for, for us and it's an empty room. Like I own condos in some digital world, right? I have five of them in Virtua and I'm going to get there and there's going to be nothing in there. What are we going to put in those condos? How am I going to create decorations? How am, I, how am I going to create tools that I'm going to use in this sort of metaverse world? Uh, those are NFTs. NFTs are the assets that you can carry around in the digital world. And what's really odd and wonderful for us is that the initial push in digital assets is art. Okay. And that's because digital assets are still or, or bridging from theoretical into the real world. And what better to be able to trade as far as a digital asset than a theoretical product, which is what we do. We create something out of nothing and it becomes a beautiful piece of what people feel in their lives. So NFTs recognized very strongly and in very powerful words by Wells Fargo here as innovations on par with electricity. So continuing with this idea, are NFTs dead? This is a report that came out uh, in last year on the previous 18 months. So it comes out for the year 2020 and the first half of 2021. And it has some really important, significant facts about it. This is a 33-page report that you can look up. It's called Art Tactic, and you can download it for free, I believe. Um, like 51% of art buyers said they thought the changes that are here now, the NFT market, the online art selling, all of that stuff are never going away, right? They're going to be permanent. Confidence is rising on people buying online. Uh, the new generation of art buyers, three out of 10 have bought their first work online, which is completely different than all of, all of you who said you were older than me, uh, a bunch of you. Um, that wasn't true for you. Like the, the people who bought your artwork first bought it in person. Those were their first purchases, but all of our new buyers, the next generation of our customers are all buying online and having an online presence and having an online tool for us to sell to them is going to be really important. Hold up. So you guys are going to hear me say some things in this webinar that are not artistic at all, right? For me, like part of how I got from U.S. Air Force bomb builder to full-time artist making six figures or more a year is I stopped selling art and I started selling a product. So you'll hear me say stuff like custom, who's going to be your next generation customer and, and what are they looking for in terms of products and, and tools or, or items they can buy and trade. That's because once I'm done making the artwork, it stops being a piece of artwork in my head and it starts becoming a product. And with that mentality, I can decide who that product is for and how to market to them. And here we have a whole generation the next generation and the ones following it, if you guys plan on being artists for the next 20 years, that's two generations that are going to buy their work online. And if you're not showing up for them, then you're weeding yourself out of the economic fort that is the art world. 
Okay, what I like about this slide is that the difference between the female and male buyers, which is kind of the difference between the initial NFT market buyer and the upcoming buyer. Okay, most of the buyers are buying because of investment reasons, and we're going to go over this in the in the future in the at the end of this webinar. But there are a big subset of of buyers, the female population, who most of them are buying because of the the emotional significance of the work. And I think that they adopting NFTs and adopting uh, and adopting uh, crypto are the first wave of the general buyer coming in of the more consumer level person who's going to be buying our work. And I think it's important to recognize that the early success of people were were was built on this idea of, of being first, being early and being an investment product, whereas the market sentiment is going to evolve into something that is a lot more like the real world market where people are seeing, feeling, evolving with our art, growing with it, and then they're adopting it into their lives. So I, I took this screenshot on the 19th, it was for the other webinar, but JPEG store on the 19th did a quarter million dollars in revenue. Okay, J, the ADA was 51 cents at that time. So 570,000 ADA is a quarter million dollars. Um, I also took this from recent um, news, BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, Samsung, all of these major players in our web two lives, in our real world lives are adopting crypto. So the idea that crypto and NFTs are dead is, this is evidence that it's not. The biggest players in our lives, the biggest players who shape our culture or who enable us to make culture ourselves are adopting NFTs and adopting the crypto world. So this stuff is not going away. I know I'm beating this into the ground, but what I want you to do is either screenshot this or write this down because as soon as you start doing NFTs, someone is going to write it to you, walk up to you and be like, oh, you're killing the environment and crypto is dead and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Ignore them. But if you can't, this is the data to remind yourself that this is not true. Uh, this uh, shot right here. Um, what am I trying to say? One, 400, 500, like over a million dollars of, uh, of ETH spent in one week on super rare. And then the another notification about PayPal joining the trust network, which is a really big deal if you are sort of present and aware and understanding how big of a deal Coinbase is to the real world that we are that we are participating in. So things like Coinbase, things like uh PayPal, they're bridging, they're bridging us from the crypto world into the NFT world. And right now we are creating the major product that sells in the NFT space. <clears throat> so the fear and greed index, okay? If you have watched, paid attention to the stock market in the past, you've heard of this fear and greed index and they have it for commodities. They have it for uh, nuclear power or oil or just the regular S&P market in general. Um, when it goes to zero, that means everyone's very afraid and participating in the market. When it goes up to hundred, everyone is being extremely greedy, okay? Right now we're in this 40 range, okay? We're right here trending. Um, can you see my mouse? Can anyone see my mouse? Just make sure that you guys, okay, good deal. So we're right here trending in this sort of like 30 to 50 range, okay? Now, if you were to have jumped into the market when it first hit its major hype phase back in February, March, April, which was, you know, March, April right here, if you were to jump in here in, in May, you would be jumping in at a peak emotional time for NFTs, and you would have immediately been met with, right after any success you had here, with a whole lot of hardship because the fear and greed index dropped off because of other macroeconomic issues. So if it were me and I was making a decision, when do I wanna build in this bear market? It's right here. It's right at the time when there is enough interest for people to be connecting to you and you can build out your presence. You can understand how to interact with people and you could build out your website and all your tools and all your discovery items so that you can be ready for the next one of these. Okay. so. Keep that in mind when you're thinking about what are you going to do next, because now is really uh, a rare occurrence from what I understand. I know I'm a younging to some of you, but it's a rare occurrence um, in a place where we can make a market out of nothing. All right. So, OK, so now NFTs are bad for the environment. Before I go here, which is going to be a short discussion, does anyone have any questions about the fear and greed index, um, any of this stuff that we talked about, the quarter million, the million dollars in a week, anything like that? Also, this is a safe space. There are no dumb questions. 
Um, unless I already gave you the answer and you ask again, then it might be a dumb question, but I'm happy to help because if I need to say it again, then that means someone else needs to hear it too. So there are no dumb questions. Please use that chat box. It keeps me feeling like I'm not talking to a wall. And I'm out of Jameson, so now you guys have to entertain me. So NFTs are bad for the environment. Let's figure out some numbers here, okay? On Cardano, which is one of the platforms I'm most active in, the, the act of buying an NFT costs the same amount of energy as two or three Google searches. The transaction data spread from you buying to that item being sent to you is the same amount of energy as two or three Google searches. Okay, Google itself uses more energy than 20% of the countries out there, right? Google itself has its own platform. But forget all that. Forget like kilowatt hours and megawatt hours and, and national energy usage. But think about it this way. I can sell an NFT through this single transaction on this platform on blockchain, right? And blockchains are doing a lot more than just NFTs. Or I can create a piece of art from, a, from wood that was cut down from a forest and plastics that were dug up out of the ground and refined, have those all shipped to me using gasoline, create that piece of artwork with whatever amount of waste that happens from that creation process, put it into another box made out of more wood, ship it with more gas all the way across the country to whoever bought it. And you, people are telling me that, oh, my NFT sale for, I don't know, four or five grand is destroying the environment when my physical sale for four or five grand did all of that, okay? Conceptually, this doesn't make any sense to anyone who's really thinking it through, but there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to think it through. They're just going to read headlines and they're going to say that Bitcoin uses more power than the entire country of Thailand. And that's true. It is true. But for the most part, none of you are going to be using Bitcoin to sell NFTs. So that's not even relevant to what you're doing. Ethereum, which is the, the most popular blockchain, is um, so Ethereum is switching from proof of work to proof of stake. And that whole merger process is going to change the way it consumes energy. So Ethereum is not going to be as energy intensive as people are complaining about it right now. And that's going to happen on like September 15th, I believe, if everything goes as planned. Um, and then blockchains like Tezos, Solana, Cardano, Stacks, those are all carbon negative. So the NFTs that are bad from the environment was true at some point, but it's not true all the time. Um, we have some questions. Marcos says there are some blockchains that are trending to be, yeah, exactly. So would the artist price the NFT at the dollar equivalent? Okay, so we can talk about pricing and there's gonna be a whole module on pricing in the NFTs for artists video series. What I would like to do uh, is if you guys can keep questions on topic to whatever we're discussing, that will help me from my brain going off in a whole different direction. And then when we hit Q&A, we can save some of those questions for a more open chat. Right. If that's cool with everyone, then great. So Jeffrey, what I would ask you to do is to copy and paste your question and, and bring it back to me later. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is blockchain. We're going to talk about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the rest of them in general. And we're going to talk about what is an NFT. And then we're going to talk about who is buying them, why, and where are they? Okay. So getting into that, does anyone have any questions about the environmental impact of, of NFTs or really on, of blockchain or the crypto market and the NFT market in, in general in terms of bull bear? You could say no also so that I don't have to like wait, but <laughs> I'm using these excuses to water my mouth, to water my tongue with melting ice. Is there a blockchain for beginners? That's a good question, Jen. Uh, no, there's not. Uh, there are blockchains that are more technically in, intense on using, but even Cardano, which is quite liter quite literally, I think it's the most technical base that you would need to to operate on the blockchain. Even Cardano is has evolved quickly over the last few months. That is going to be just as easy as going to Etsy and putting in your putting up your art. Okay, it really isn't that hard, but I think there are things you need to understand about Web3 and blockchain in order to really behave and, and interact with this new environment um, safely. So 
what is blockchain? Okay, a blockchain is a decentralized le ledger. So basically what that means is just like you guys used to have checkbooks that you wrote down all the ledgers in, that's what you have. That's what blockchain is, but it's public and it's immutable. You or anyone else could never go back to one of your transactions and cross it out or smudge the ink and change a number. No one can do that to your transactions and neither can you do it to your own. That's what it means to be immutable. So Bitcoin does this and only this. It tracks transactions and then it pays the people who are uh, who are verifying those transactions in Bitcoin, creating a currency that runs on the internet, okay? And that's all it does, tracks more transactions, pays out more Bitcoin, and those numbers are limited. The number of Bitcoin is limited and that can't be changed either. So it becomes a very uh, measurable, finite tool for tracking wealth. And that's all Bitcoin does. It's a decentralized record of transactions that cannot be changed. And I'll go over a little bit more about that in a second. So what we are used to is this idea of centralization, where when I slip my card into a card reader and I buy something, the data of what I bought, the data of the transaction goes to this bank here. The bank does whatever it wants to do with that data in the background, and then I get a receipt back. Okay. And this comes with a lot of problems. Okay. Problem number one, we don't have any access or control over our data. Because when it goes from here into the bank, this is called a gated garden. So when you when things have passwords and paywalls and all that stuff, everything goes behind the garden and we can't get in and, and see what they're doing with our data or claim ownership of that data, right? So that's problem number one. Problem number two is having a central point of converting all of this information is a central point of failure. So when I transact with Chase Bank over the internet, basically my data goes to one place, gets crunched, and then I get reported back, hopefully what it is that I asked for. The problem with that is those, datas, those data points can be attacked. And because there's only one or two places to verify or to keep that data secure, when someone changes that data, we can't, and there's no way of seeing that, that falsification of data from where we are sitting on the outside. And then problem number three is that the people who run this could be assholes. Basically, the people who run our businesses or who run and control our data are an oligarchy that we have no control over. We have no leverage over how they use our data and no purview over what they are doing with it. So this is the centralized system that we are used to today, and it has worked, okay? So Facebook, all the social medias that we interact with, any of the businesses, we go into their system, we log in with their system to their thing and they control all of the data we use. And that's why we've had a free internet from well, mostly free internet up until this point, because we're exchanging the usage of whatever it is they're offering for, uh, for the data that we're giving them, which is whatever comes with whatever tool we're using. So they can pull our, our age, our demographics, whatever. They turn that data into marketing tools that they can sell. and Personally, I don't see all that much wrong with it, but Web3 is going to give us a hybrid that where we can choose to do that or we can choose not to. So I got ahead of myself, but um, there's no transparency, single point of failure, and we have no control over who is running what we're doing. So decentralization, on the other hand, something I hinted at before, when we run a transaction over here, let's say we operate with the bank or I send money to Joe, instead of the bank being the mid person for that transaction, our transaction is peer to peer. And instead of the bank verifying that our transaction went through, everybody who's connected to the network, our decentralized network is going to verify that transaction. So if I do a transaction with, with Joe and with Heather and with Jennifer, who these are the faces I can see, um, and they, then someone in Issaquah and someone in, Singapore and then someone in France, they're going to verify that transaction and then it's going to go on to the blockchain. So that transaction is verified by hundreds of people or hundreds of data centers and then put onto the blockchain. In order to falsify that data, someone would have to attack every single place that verified our transaction. So this is taking the control over our security 
away from the people who can do what they want with their information and putting it out to the blockchain. And I said that the blockchain is a public immutable record. So we know or we can see what is happening to our data when we do those transactions. That's why people who are focused on sort of evolving or changing the way that we live and work with the internet and with these companies and our data, that's what they really see in the future of blockchain being is this place where there's transparency and this place where people can't fraud us, okay? So in a nutshell, that's what blockchain is. So what this was, I was supposed to talk through this as I was clicking, but basically there's no middleman and we don't have to trust anything or we don't have to have permission. So like I said, when I wanna sign into Facebook, I have to sign into Facebook and, and hope that the Facebook entity lets me in. In Web3 with blockchain, you don't do that. There's nobody who to say you can get in or out. I don't need anyone's permission to be a part of the internet. That's what Web3 is, it's permissionless, okay? And I, that's kind of a hard topic to get across or subject to consume. If anyone has any questions about that, please throw that out. So. We don't have to deal with anyone who might be controlling our data for nefarious or just reasons or motivations that don't align with us. And we don't have to deal with crooks because no one can steal our stuff or falsify our, our things. Um, and then we don't need permission to interact on the internet. So that's what that's one of the major things that Web3 or the blockchain offers people. Jennifer, you look like you're not following. Are you doing okay? Yeah, okay. Like some people are here for the second time and I understand because you have to really try to absorb this and I'm, I'm doing my best to break it down for you. But if I need to break it down more, chances are someone else needs to hear it again too. So go ahead and ask. All right, so what is Ethereum? We talked about Bitcoin, right? Let's put Bitcoin down here. Bitcoin is a generation one blockchain. The first one that came out, it came out in like 2010, right after the economic crash. Okay, Ethereum is a generation two. Second generation blockchain that is programmable. So I said Bitcoin can only track as a ledger transactions going to and from and whatnot, right? That's all it can do. But Ethereum can be programmed on top of. It can be built upon. So that means that you can you can build programs and applications on the website that we can use on the blockchain. And they do that with smart contracts. And this is all important to understanding how NFTs work. So if you guys are watching and starting to like fall asleep, I want you to understand this so that you understand what an NFT is because it, it's this part is really important to how you operate as a artist on the NFT space. So a smart contract is an executable per set of parameters that happen whether or not that happened regardless as long as the parameters are met. So once you create a smart contract and you put it on blockchain, it cannot be altered. So if me and uh, Deborah are playing poker and I bet her 50 bucks and my newborn kitten that I'm gonna win this hand and she bets me something, whatever, and the parameters are met when we show our cards that I win, like my two pair versus her one pair in high card, right? So I win. I don't have to trust that Deborah is going to slide her chips across the table. Okay. There's nobody and there's nothing for me to trust that the that that our contract, whether I would win or she would win, is going to be executed because the smart contract will do it automatically. So and then since it's on blockchain, I can see all the parameters of the smart contract and I know exactly what it's going to do. And I don't have to worry about whether or not it's going to happen. So if I was having a foot race with Joe and I bet him a car and I win the foot race, then I'm going to get that car. And I never have to think twice if Joe's going to give me the pink slip. So smart contracts are really powerful. Anything that can be programmed can be done as a smart contract. Everything from our foot race to how a business transacts on the stock market can be programmed into a trust uh, a smart contract. And since I don't have to trust that Joe or Deborah are going to pay me for whatever it is that we bet, I don't have to trust this. I don't have to trust them. The whole system is trustless. So that's where that term comes from. Okay. I'm going to keep going. If you guys are following, I'm going to keep going. So what is a, a non-fungible token? A non-fungible token is a unique asset that can be stored on the blockchain through tokenization. So let's talk about it in terms of your art. 
this is your artwork, this is the blockchain. When you mint a piece of artwork, minting is the process of tokenizing your art onto the blockchain, it is going to be minted with this unique number. And this unique number will forever point back to the piece of art that was established with it at that time. Okay, so this number will never be repeated, right? I just smashed some buttons to make this, but what we what this really will be is a cryptographic encryption that will identify the metadata of this onto blockchain. So if I wanna put this piece of art on blockchain, I would take a picture of it and I would mint it and it would get a unique number. It's non-fungible, meaning it's not cannot be copied or cannot be repeated. So it is uniquely identified. And this is what makes sure this is what change this is what is different between the blockchain and NFT market and just going online and selling a digital piece of art. Because the the digital thing that I sold you over Facebook for whatever doesn't have a source product or a history. You can't look it up and see where it came from and you can't verify that there are none other like it or that if I make a limited number of them, that that's what is in the data. So this is really, really important because this is what's going to make all the stuff that we have in the digital world unique. Mato says, does the blockchain store the digital art or does it keep it in a digital version locally? So the way it works right now, is that the digital art goes into something called in the interplanetary file system, which is in, in essence, another blockchain, although not exactly, but it's a distributed file system. So your work gets, if you can visualize this, your work gets uploaded, it, all the data of it gets copied a, a million times and fragmented a million times and sent to everybody who's participating in the IPFS network. So I've been on the computer, I have an IPFS account, Deborah's gone and been on there. Anyone else who's been in the NFT space, like the IPFS network, the interplanetary file system is distributed. So if my computer goes down, then the file is still up there. It's still out there. Every computer on the entire network would have to go away in order for your file to be lost. Um, our copyright still needed with unique digital numbers. Okay, let's talk about that, Lydia, as we get toward it, but the short answer, is yes, you always need a copyright, but you're not gonna lose your copyright by participating in this market. All right. So another way of saying uh, is stored on the blockchain is that the asset is designated by a token stored on the blockchain. So if I worded it in two ways to help you guys sort of understand it, but basically your work is, is serialized and put in a place where that serial number and that location or the data of it cannot be altered or changed or destroyed. So how do you sell this? Like, what is the point of the NFT? So I kind of touched on this. So if I were to sell a piece of digital art um, without the blockchain, then let's say I sell it to someone who's in this room. Let's say I sell it to, to Pat Virgo and, and I sell it, then when she goes to sell it, there's no history of who owned it or where it came from or what the previous price was. Nothing besides what she says it was. There's no verifiable history of where that came from. But on the blockchain, that's established. And it's, non, it's tamper-proof because we know about this cryptographic number and we know when and where it was, uh, when and, and how it was minted and then how or where it came from and where the art points to. So let me try to make that make more, more significant. Let's say Hubble takes a photo, right? The Hubble telescope or, or the new one that's a million miles away, the James Webb telescope, takes the most amazing photo and it mints it to blockchain, okay? So this one photo is the original, is the signature photo that was owned by the James Webb telescope and the organization and there's proof of that because of the wallet that minted it and the and where it came from. Now, someone at the same time takes a screenshot of that photo, okay? If they try to sell that screenshot, the history of it, which is what they uploaded themselves or minted themselves or didn't mint and just tried to sell the digital, doesn't align with the actual source of the real, of the real piece of art. So they would in effect have done a forgery, but, the in this case the original is provable right the hubble original telescope and that picture would have value 
right? Like, let's say Hubble took a picture of a spaceship somewhere out there. That picture would be really, really valuable. And, um, and its history, being able to prove where it came from and that it's the original, that it came from the source, like the guy who hit the button is, um, is what will give that photo value. Okay. Can I get a, uh-huh. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so who is buying NFTs? Okay. Who is buying these things? I have no idea how long I've been talking, but let's do this. So there's a complicated web of, um, of, of motivations behind buying an NFT. And what I did for this is try to figure, is try to just illustrate the main reasons that someone would buy an NFT. So number one, investment. So when, especially now, while, while we're still early, in this whole technolo technological development, um, people can put money into an NFT and then sell it for more in the future. Okay, so someone wants to buy a piece of art of mine, they're gonna buy it because they think that my value in the art world is going to grow and they can sell it, excuse me, and they can sell it for more money in the future. So that's an investment. Two, storage of wealth. If someone buys a piece of gold and they put that gold in their safe, that piece of gold can't get taxed. No one knows it exists really, or no one can tax its value until it's sold again or traded for a taxable currency, such as dollars or pesos or whatever. So you can store wealth through this system of buying an NFT, okay? And then three is because they love art, right? Like ownership is fun is, is what we had right in here. And like, like Deborah, like you've seen this, right? You've been participating in the market for a while and buying NFTs is fun. It's the idea of ownership is integral to how and who we are, who we are as people. So that doesn't change when it comes to digital. Like I've looked at pe people trading like Pokemon cards, right? And I'm sorry if you trade Pokemon cards and I just laughed at you, but I've looked at people and I've been like, you're freaking crazy. You paid $500, $10,000, for this doodle on a piece of paper, right? But they find value in it and they love owning it. Owning it is important, right? I've seen like videos where they're like, no, I'm not selling it. It's a $400,000 Charizard card. They're like, no, nah, it's mine. I don't want to get rid of it. Ownership is a real thing. And just because the ownership becomes digital doesn't change the way we feel about it. If you question that, or if someone questions you on this, when you're having this discussion about your NFTs, ask them if you can delete all the photos on their phone, right? And they're gonna say no, because those photos are theirs and they're part of their memory, it's attached to them, it's their history or whatever. If they believe in the digital value of their pictures they took with their phone, then they believe in digital ownership. And it's the same thing. Um, some people buy cars, some people buy Charmander and other people buy NFTs, okay? Um, and so then there's people who, <laughs> Joe, Joe's talent, Joe wants to give the presentation. Um, I'll explain the wall, wall space. So, uh, I, if my camera wasn't over there, I'll show you. So I have no wall space in my loft. Like I collected this piece last year from the Collazos. I have a few pieces by this Christina Wynn and then this other piece by this eyes guy and if I, there comes a limit for an art collector when they don't have space to buy more art, but they they buy art, not simply to, de to decorate their home, but they're buying it because they love the act of philanthropy, of supporting an artist, of owning things that they find connection to and that they think are beautiful. Um, so there are collectors who I've spoken to and who've heard from, and they're like, well, I can't buy any more art for my house. And NFTs has been a, is, is a great solution to this idea of I want to own the pretty things and now I can. I actually have, I have one, one collector who's like this wealthy, but they have storage units that are full of art that are separated by season. Like, so they, they pay someone every year, three or four times a year to come in and redecorate the house with the art they own to switch it up for like the fall or whatever. And um, if NFTs were around while they were coming up, I wouldn't be too remiss to say that they would probably have just bought NFTs instead because they don't have any place to put the art so they can just have it and they can carry it with them everywhere, uh, which is something that I think is fun as an art collector um, that 
when I, if I wanted to tell someone about this piece of art, like, let's say I'm out and I don't know, we're talking about dark creative stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, I love dark art. I have this piece at home that's by Gabriel Collazo. It's made out of railroad ties and resin and, and fire burns, whatever, however he made this thing. I can't get the words out of my brain right now. Instead, I can just show it to them. And it's really mine. I get to show someone something that's mine. And I, I just don't think you can underestimate the value of, of owning something on the internet. So in a nutshell, this is where this is what we needed to get started, right? We need to understand what blockchain is. We need to understand where or where NFTs come from or what they are and how they store provenance. What's next? What does it take to start selling NFTs is you have to understand how to interact with the blockchain, how to work with the the people who are buying from you, like how to get into their head and understand what it is they're looking for so that you can make an offer, right? Here's a sidebar. Stop selling stuff <laughs> and instead make offers to people, right? When you're selling things in, in this realm, what you're really doing is giving people an offer and asking them whether they like it or not. So example, today I messaged a few people because I have a giant piece of art sitting around that I got back from a collector. One of my collectors is going through some hard times. I got some shit. So I'm like, instead of calling up people who I know wanted a piece of art, but let's say didn't want to spend full price. I was like, yeah, hey, I got this piece back and there's an opportunity for you to buy, to, to collect a piece at a, at a discount because of this situation. And then I just wait to hear them say yes or no. Right. So instead of being like, Hey, do you want to buy this? Right. That's a sale. It's more of a understanding how people want to be spoken to so that you can reach out to them and speak their language and have it mirrored back and forth. So each one of those conversations is a little bit different. And I have like four of them going right now. Uh, <clears throat> so next steps is understanding the market and understanding uh, basically these two things, like nurturing community and understanding the mechanics of the NFT market. And that is what this NFTs for artists video series is about, right? Each one of these videos that I have in this series is something like between 20 minutes to over an hour. So if you want to sit here for an hour with me for 10 hours and go over all of the stuff, um, the best way to do it would be through this series. So I'm going to tell you about the series for a little bit. And while we do that, you guys can queue up your, convert, your questions and then we can get straight into the Q&A. So the mechanics is understanding how to assemble a drop. Kind of like doing an art release in the real world when you do like an art show or an, or an art event, an NFT drop is sort of the same thing, but you're doing it in the digital world. You're doing it online and over, over Twitter and over Discord and eventually over metaverse real estate. And then um, someone is unmuted, same guy. So then you have to understand NFT Twitter and understand how blockchains work because there are multiple blockchains and, and working with each of them is a little bit different. This is everything that I put together for you guys. And Deborah is a full TASA member. So you guys can ask her what she thinks of everything that I've put in here. I think there's another full TASA member in here already, but everything from understanding the glossary of what does WAGME mean to, um, and what does trustless permissionlessness mean to understanding some of the slang that happens in, in NFTs a comparison of all the blockchains, walking through all the different ways to interact with your wallets, minting on Cardano, minting on ETH, all of these 17 modules, and there'll probably be more. Like I know already for this um, building community, I'm going to record a whole separate video just on Twitter spaces. I already have one in there that's like 40 minutes, but that's the basis of, of operating in this community world, but I want to go specifically into how I interact with people directly. Okay, so I'm adding more to this as it goes on. And then nurturing community is how you, how you can go and have an audience that you can sell to uh, more often, right? So the most, so this is me saying something callous to the art world, right? Uh, building community in one hand is how do you build a friend network and build a collector network so that people can discover your work. But building community in the realist business sense is how do you leverage your connections to expand your reach to your art? And you have to do both in this online world. You have to build friendships, but also build friendships that produce art for you that produce art sales and produce greater reach to more more eyes and that's sort of the stuff that we're going to go over in the course and then 
the course itself is two ninety seven or three payments of ninety seven dollars. And I actually, I don't know if I talked to you about this yet, Deborah, but one of the things that I'm going to do with this and every time we do a launch is I want to create a pool or a community wallet that has 10% of the funds that we raise from this. And that's going to be used to buy artwork from TASA members, from NFTs for Artists video series members. And of course, with all of my stuff, there's a 30-day money back guarantee. And that's basically, if you stub your toe and decide you don't like me anymore, I give you your freaking money back because I just don't have the patience to work with um, with people who aren't going to, you know, I'm not going to fight you, basically. So, oh, it plays. I forgot. So Q&A time. Um, that's what we got right now. Here's, I'm going to drop a link in for everybody. And I'll probably put it in a few times, but where you can go and check out the course. There's a video in there that explains every module. So you can get an idea of what you're signing up for. And that's the spiel. You can copy and paste that. Or I can give you a clickable link. All right, how many people are in here? There's 34 people. How many people out of the 34 here have downloaded the POAP app? Give me a, a Y or... This could have been your first digital asset. Luann already got hers. No, not yet. Lydia got hers. Okay. Where is it? So there was a, I gave you an NFT starter pack, which included a roadmap and a the NFT starter pack itself that um, had the directions for how to do all of these things. So there is uh, just a few people. So what I'm going to do, can't even, I have too many windows open, is I am going to, if you did download it, then send me a message privately and I'll send you a link to get your PO app before this ends. And then the floor is open to anything that you guys want to discuss. I am here for you. You can come up on stage or you can raise your hand and I'll see that in the chat in the participation box. I believe I will. I don't have the ability to raise my own hand, so I'm not really sure, um, but there should be a button for you guys to do that. Fab, I saw you came up. Did you wanna jump up? Go for it. Yeah, it says that only you can uh, uh, share in this meeting. So anyways, I, I it's gonna start like a really, really stupid question. Oh. <laughs> um, I understand your concept of the blockchain. Once somebody buys that artwork, which is a digital artwork, um, I, how can you just sell another one of these pieces? Because then you kind of like, did you lose your, uh, in fine art, fine art photography, the idea is you can sell multiple times the same work. And that, that is really, I don't understand that. So if I sold a piece of art, like a reproduction at a gallery, what would prevent me from printing another one and putting it in a, diff a different gallery? Okay. Nothing, so, right? So, but, so really the, the only thing that would prevent an artist from basically defrauding his collectors is the integrity of him as a business person as an, as an, and as an artist. And that's something that the collector has to trust when he's buying from an, an artist, especially as the prices go higher, they're going to look at you as more of, is this guy going to rug me? That's that's the word in, in the NFT land. Is, is he going to pull the rug on me by devaluing the art that, that I bought from him by selling another copy? So the, the long, the short answer is that nothing will keep you from doing that or keep an artist from doing that except their integrity as a business person got you okay but because the work is a photography to start with or digital art which is understood to be able to reproduce at multiple you can either create a a, a limited series for to be made for instance that would then increase the value yeah, so scarcity is always going to carry value with it, no matter what it is. 
Um, so you so you can always attach or or justify some of the value that you're putting on your art by its scarcity. Um, I'm not sure. I think I lost track of your question. No, no. Yeah, I, I think you're you're you. Uh, and then the next thing is that can people print your own what what you minted? They cannot. Okay, so the short answer on on copyright or intellectual property is that you don't lose it by selling the digital piece. Okay, oh. the way copyright law is written is as soon as you create something. It's actually really controversial, like the copyright law in general. But basically, if you create something, it's attributed to you for life plus 76 years. So during that time, you cannot lose the IP rights unless you sign them off, unless you give them away. Now, if you are giving people a digital file and you don't want them to print it, what you need to do is not give them a printable file. So not upload, because whenever you put something on the internet, they're going to be able to download what they what you upload, like the original file. So you want to not put up a, a, a printable file. So like what I do, and I go into detail on how to prepare your files in the course, but what I do is I provide files less than 4,000 pixels and only in sRGB format so that it, they won't create good prints. Um, not like when I print a file from my work, the print file itself is normally over a gig because that's how much data is in all the colors and all the detail. But I don't give them that. I give them a four megabyte, 4,000 pixel image and that's it. So that's one way to prevent people from doing it. But in general, people can always right click and upsize and, and try to upload your work. But I, again, as an artist operating in this digital space, you just need to roll with that. And and limit as many opportunities for that to happen. Yeah, and I wouldn't care about the people uh, printing. It's just understanding that I still own that copyright. So if this would only work great in business out of it, that's a different story. But well, you, if they you just should care, you should care because two reasons: your digital asset and your physical asset have two different values, right? Like my real work, my physical work, or analog work, whatever you want to call it. I get hung up on real world versus digital myself, even though I've been in this for a while. My analog work starts at $3,000, right? So if I give someone the digital version of that and then they print it, they've basically stolen $3,000 from me or $3,000 of opportunity cost is lost or they have they have violated the integrity of my edition because I say there's only five pieces out there. Now there's a sixth vagrant piece from someone who just printed it. So you should definitely care. And on the flip side of that, you can give them rights. Like you can say in the metadata, you can print this when you own it, right? So that would be a limited rights, right? Or um, I have it in the course to define it about the different types of licensing, but you're basically you're giving them a license to print one, pile, one piece for personal use. And because you're doing that, because you provided the file for that, you can charge more. Right, so the physical production, reproduction of the of the artwork is oh, is still a super valuable part of your business. Got you. Well, thank you. I think that that clarified a lot of things. Thank you. Sorry for talking over you. I have a bad habit of that. Um, Lydia, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Just answered my questions with the hi, sorry, hi. I think you just answered my questions um, about the the copyright and printing the digital files. So I'm good. And it's great to see you. Nice to see you too. Or hear you. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll I'll I'm I'll video in next time. That's okay. Um, okay, so we got some questions in the chat box for and if anybody, you can raise your hand and come up on stage too. Um, can you have limited edition on different marketplace? How does that work for simple editions on different marketplaces? This is from Aurora or Aurora. Um, can you have limited editions? Yeah, so one of the times that I, I uploaded a project and I did, um, thanks. So Luann put another link into the, uh, to the NFTs for artists page for me. So thank you. Uh, yeah, you can do anything you want as long as you define what you're doing. 
So if you put it in the metadata or put it in the details of the artwork that you're doing that I'm going to put five on this marketplace and five on that marketplace, that's totally fine. Um, and even better than that, you can, with in Cardano, you can do your own policy ID. So the policy ID will follow the collection and basically hold the collection together. Think of it as like a broad title that holds everything together. Um, or, and then on Ethereum, you can make your own contracts now using Manifold and you could list some pieces on one marketplace and some places on another. So you, um, you have options to do that as long as you're clear. You could even do some pieces on one network, like one blockchain and some pieces on another blockchain if you wanted. You just have to make sure that the buyers understand that they are getting one of 10, but five are available on this blockchain and whatnot. So, um, but again, you to, to extend on your question, you couldn't load the same piece on both. So if you say it's a one of one, then you can't, put another one of one on another chain or another marketplace. People will discover it for sure. Um, Heather, go ahead. You're muted still. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so, I mostly do photography, but I integrate photography into a lot of other mediums. And I have a question about um, three dimensional, that you can walk around 360 and see it from a number of different views. In terms of creating it as an NFT, do you, are you saying, Essentially, creating one view of that sculpture, or can you create an NFT that essentially gives like a full view from all sides? So you would be creating. There's two ways to do it. You can you can create a virtual, um, so you, or you can create. There's two ways to do it. You can, you can create a virtual object, or you can create. Uh, I'm gonna mute you. I think there's some feedback. Uh, okay, so you can create a virtual object. There's a uh, feedback coming from someone. All right, so there's something called an HLB file, which is a three-dimensional um, augmented reality file, which, and you can sell that. So that you can record your piece of art using a, a special camera. I don't know how to do it myself, um, but I can definitely get you to someone who can. Uh, but you would walk around it and scan it in all the different angles. And then it would put together that file and that would be an, an augmented reality piece that someone can take with their phone and look through it and see it, right? See it from whatever angle they can walk around it or what have you. Or you can create a virtual reality piece, which will show only through a virtual reality setting, um, which again would be through your phone or through a headset. The difference is augmented reality is I can show it on my floor right there and I'll see my floor and see my room where virtual is you're immersed in the system. Um, but yes, you totally can. So you would be, you'd be selling, selling that file. And for the most part, most marketplaces support up to 100 megabytes of file size. So if you can keep it under that file size then you can sell it almost anywhere. Um, if you have to go larger than that, then you would just put that into the smart contract or what have you, that's you get access to this file based on your, the NFT you owned, which is a key to it. Okay, you're muted again, but I saw the head nod. So I think we're- Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so I am here to help guys. So if you have questions, please, please let me help you. Um, Joe, go for it. Great, thanks. So. As a photographer, how did you go? I'm a, I'm a painter and I do works on, works on paper. So I do do a traditional uh, two-dimensional media, but, uh, which is not unlike you being a, a photographer, your stuff was on the walls, right? How did you find a uh, good market for your for NFTs and getting into that realm? Um, so if you hang out with me for a while, you'll start to realize that I'm going to say the same thing over and over. It doesn't matter where you put your work. What only What really matters is how much traffic you can get to it. So there's only one, I think, now, two, photography only or lens-based art 
only platforms and they're both uh curated or or uh, you have to apply to get into them. So it's Sloika and Ephemera. And I haven't heard anything about Ephemera in months. So I think Sloika might be the only one. So you would apply and you would get in and that's a photography-based platform. But you can put your work on any platform. You can put it on Foundation. You can put it on Super Rare if you get in there. You can put it on JPEG Store. You can put it on Magic Eden. There's a bunch of them. The, the only thing is, is that you're going to basically commit to marketing to that one platform. And, and that's it. So you would choose yours based on, uh, I would say, whether or not you like the presentation of the site, right? And that's one of the things, I do go over a bunch of sites in the thing, but you go there and you'd be like, okay, I like the way they show your work. Like I would never put my work on Magic Eden because they, I don't like the way they present it. I think it would not, it would be lackluster. So I do, wouldn't put it there. Um, so I, I put it in a place like Foundation that really presents the work in a in a beautiful way. And does that does that platform have a strong following? Okay, most of the platforms have you know tens of thousands of you know following or people who are buying and transacting. But some of them, well, the good ones, have hundreds of thousands. So like I showed you, JPEG Store quoted a million dollars in sales in one day, uh, and that's pretty much you know they fluctuate around that. And that's the fourth largest marketplace. So. OpenSea or Foundation or these other really big ones, Magic Eating is one of the big ones. They all are, have a lot of traffic. It's just, do you like the community that surrounds it? And do you want to market to that spot? Um, how much, what do they charge for operating on, you know, as far as fees and, and all that? It's a lot to, there's a lot of little things to consider, but basically you can do, you can go anywhere. Most of my stuff on the Cardano blockchain is not on any marketplace. It's on my website. You can mint directly from me without the use of a marketplace. Same if you use uh, Manifold and you mint your own or you make your own contracts, you can just have it transact through your own website. And a lot of people have been asking me about being spread out over too many, too many places. And I really think the solution is stop sending people to foundation, stop sending people to, you know, the fine art Americas of the blockchain and start creating your own contracts and bringing people to your website. So one of the things you'll see me do, and maybe I'll do it so that everyone inside can do it side by side with me, but I'm going to create a whole new website, jasonmatias.io, that's only going to have my blockchain stuff. So you can go there and instead of seeing landscapes, seascapes, portraits, or whatever the hell, I, the way I divide my regular stuff up, it'll be by maybe by marketplace or by blockchain. So here's my Cardano mints, here's my Ethereum mints, here's my Stacks mints. And, um, and then I'll just direct all the traffic there. Cutting out the middleman again. That's what Jordan. the beauty of the internet is, right? Yeah. And you'll hear, you'll hear in the NFT world that oh, the people will be like, oh my God, I never had the opportunity to, um, to sell my work before and blah, 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 because I couldn't get into a gallery. I haven't done gallery shows in 10 years. Right? Like sometimes I put my work up in a gallery, but when I do, I don't do anything for it. Like that's their freaking job. Right. My job is to get people to my own places to buy work directly from me. So, you know, like we've been able to be artists for a long time. What's different about Web3 is that we can connect with our collectors. Like I can go DM one of my collectors and have a conversation with them right now. Right? And, I, and I think like in my, per my Discord, I have over 140. But I think realistically from all the people who are not in there, I have like closer to 200 people who have bought stuff from me through the NFT space. And they're they're all congregated into these communities that I think you can reach out and have a conversation. They're there participating in my career or in your career in some fashion, which was not possible in the real world, in the analog world. Because people just didn't behave that way. I went uh, on a rant, but um all right, so I didn't get any private DMs for the Po app. So um, you guys have about 10 minutes until until I run out of alcohol to message me so I can send that to you. Um, go ahead, Betsy. Um, 
money is my question. I've heard all kinds of stuff about how you have to put a lot into it to get started with this. And I have none. I mean, I'm on a disability income. And my husband will probably have me committed if I spend anything else on my artwork. <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand what you're, where you're coming from. And uh, at one time, the price of... Um, at one time, the, the price of participating in the NFT market was really high. So, and like my first mints, I was spending three or $400 just to put the artwork up. And that was a lot of freaking money and it hurt. And, I'm, and I was kind of like, why the hell am I doing this? But half the reason that I did it was so that I could tell all the NFT, all the people in the artist selling art about it and figure it out on my own. Um, for them but partly you know that was just the hype of the moment so I got in when the chart was all the way was was heading up and the hype was really high um, uh, but it doesn't you can start with ten dollars and that ten dollars would last a while because so the cost of operating on Cardano the transaction fee is 0.14 to 0.18 ADA. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, da, 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 da. that is, I can't do that math in my head, but it's a fraction of a penny. Okay. Plus on Cardano, you have to, there's something called UTXO. So it's just going to cost you two ADA to transfer artwork around. So two ADA right now is $1. Now on Stacks or on, on Tezos or on the Solana blockchain, it's zero 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 something like it's super super cheap to operate on those blockchains so you can get started with with nothing um for those of you who send me dms i see them i just can't do two things at once uh so yeah you can get started with very much next to nothing and then the the one hurdle that i think you'll have is the whatever the cost is of getting your artwork scanned or photographed to get put on Someone said, please send whatever you were speaking about. Uh, left uh, yeah, I'll hook you up, guys. Um, can you mint a Cardano with free with the vending machine? Yeah, that's right. So on Cardano, you can actually mint for free with a vending machine. So you, that's basically a sell on demand. So like you create this, basically this smart contract for lack of a better term that uh, holds all of your art. And if someone buys it, then the transaction fees are taken out of the sale. So um, here is what I'm going to do for all the people that are DMing me. I'm actually going to tell you to DM Luann. <laughs> Luann, did I send you that document uh, with all the uh, stuff on it? Yeah, you have it? OK. Yeah, if you can just cut and, and paste some links to people. Um, the secret word aura was for the live one that happened on Tuesday. So you're going to get a link to, to click to get your PO app from, from from Luann, okay. Um, and I lost a window. So I hope that that helps. That that is one of the things that are really cool about some of these blockchains is it really doesn't cost much. Now on Ethereum, as as a the cost of operating on Ethereum goes up as the blockchain load goes up. So there was so much activity on the blockchain when I got started and likely the news that you're hearing about is was back in February, March, April, that the cost of transacting on the blockchain went up just like the cost of a taxi or the cost of, of Uber goes up when there's a lot of demand on the network for Uber. So back then it was really high. And if it ever gets that high again, then the prices are gonna go up for Ethereum. But for the other blockchains, you're not gonna run into that problem. All right. Well, while we talk, I can uh, share something else. I'll just just gonna browse the website until you guys ask me another question. Um, screen share, screen share, new share. I'll just share my whole screen and see what's up. 
So I, I either did a really good job or, and you guys understood everything or, uh, okay. So what are the different ways that people um, can get to reorganize my screen? What are the different ways that people um, all over the place here? People can view display. Okay, so people can view and display the NFCs that they own on the web, on the desktop, on their phone, on, and on digital displays, which are becoming much, much more feasible in terms of like a snob artist like me would be like, no, you, I don't want you to show it on that crappy screen. But there's really beautiful new screens by Samsung uh, that are actually clear until they are turned on with color. And then they become really, really opaque and, and have beautiful displays. So if they own their NFT, they can put it on display right there. And that's the, that's the limited license that anyone gets who buys something. They can display it for personal use to less than 100 people. In general, that's sort of like the baseline. If they're displaying it to more than 100 people, then it starts becoming like a public commercial use. Um, and of course, that's not really enforced and there's no way to enforce it. But in general, that's the copyright or that's the, the right that they're getting when they buy it. But digital displays, yeah. Joe, Christina, please send a message to Luann. I thought I could type out to you guys while I was typing out to everyone else, but that's um, that's not working while I was talking to everyone else. So she's here in the comments too. Luann, if you turn your video um, back on, then I can put you up on the screen here and people can just click on your name to send you a message. There she is. So you can just double click on, on her name or and send her a message that way. Send message, make me add pin. Yeah, trying to get you guys the PO app, but that was really, if I'm being honest, was for the Tuesday webinar. I wasn't really planning on doing a second webinar because I run out, I run out of voice is one, one of the things. Um, but yeah, they, don't worry, you guys will, anyone who wants one will get one. What are some advantages of specific blockchains? So I think what you're going to run into with the different blockchains is whether or not the community aligns with with you and your mentality. Like I'm very education oriented and I'm very teacherly for lack of a better term. Uh, and that's, and the Cardano blockchain is very like leans towards our, car, leans towards education and leans towards this sort of group learning and everyone getting, you know, everyone growing together. And, and I like that. Uh, of course, there's different subsets of every community, but in general, that's like the overarching, um, trend of the way people behave there. Whereas on Ethereum, there's, it's very friend oriented and friend group oriented. So clicky. So I, I found a way to say clicky without saying it in a negative way. And what's interesting is that you can go onto Ethereum and a lot of people don't understand how the blockchain works. And they're, they're just there scrambling to get a sale. And it's really for the people who have been in for a while, like we just don't like participating in that. And I think that's especially some of you who are, who, who are, I guess, older for, for lack of a better term, aren't going to vibe with those people with that type of mentality and that type of like, me, 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 look at me. You can get in a conversation in a space on most Ethereum sort of share art spaces on Twitter. And um, you can talk about your art. So if I was Joe, right now and I'd be like, yeah, I paint these hearts with these wings and I really want them to represent this and that and, and whatever. And these are the colors I like. And then someone will come up and they'll say, yeah, I really love the format and I love the way you made that red and those clear wings. And, and but this is the thing that I did. And they'll just change the conversation like right on you. So, and it's not all bad, it's not all like that, but the, that's in general, again, like the umbrella of the, the community there. So in terms of where you can sell your art, which are going to be the advantages, um, for me, one of the things is like, where do I vibe? And then, um, excuse me, then there's differences on like price points, like the, there are more higher sales on ETH than on like Cardano or Tezos especially. And 
different, you know, nuances there. I actually have like the blockchain versus blockchain tutorial is a 15, 20 minute discussion of each blockchain um, to try to break that down, just that answer, because I get it a lot, that question a lot. While I was clicking around, I accidentally opened up a ton of my pictures and I was like, oh, this got confusing. So I just turned off my screen share. Hang on a tick. So, um, okay. Yeah, I'm glad that helped a little bit. Christian, Christian. So the doors close to the the membership. So let me tell you what you what you guys get in there besides what I already showed you. Uh, what I think the best part of the of any of my groups, and like maybe I can get a head nod from Deborah about this if uh, if I'm right. But I think that one of the best parts is this community thing, where um, we're able to leverage each other in terms of growth to help with growth and we're able to keep each other moving and motivated. So the education is all there. Like all of these modules each have, um, like here's the blockchain versus blockchain one that we were talking about. Um, there's the cheat sheet and then there's 20 minutes, 10 minutes, nine minutes, six minutes, all of this stuff that's that I talk about to go through like what I know and how I feel about these chains. But then there's like the, the 200 something people that are in art of selling art. And then this new course has a few dozen people in it. Um, already, so we can help leverage our our group and ourselves to to grow, and that's what the TASA Launchpad is. And I think it's going to have some cool. Um, so we're going to do some fun things going forward with the Launchpad. Um, is that in Discord? So this is what you're looking at right now is the actual website for the course for the for all the video material. So when you log in, the Discord link is right here. And then you'll have the, the roadmap for how to do a drop. And then these are the three, six, nine, 12, 15, 17 modules. The Discord looks like like this. And I know people are having trouble with Discord, but this is where the, the world sort of operates or where this network sort of operates. And until there's something better than than this product for keeping community, uh, this is where it's gonna be at. So this is the Art of Selling Art Discord. Luann just put a link in there for everyone. In here, you have you know this guide, this, these videos I made for you so that you can manage and learn how to use Discord. There's this voice channel, which Mardos hasn't left for like two days, but basically we can jump in here and have conversations. And here's the public chat where we can create every day, share our art, have discussions about what's going on with the NFTs and whatnot. And then when you join, you know, after, after I'm done with this launch, then I'm gonna spend most of my time with the video series owners and with the uh, TASA members because like I said, I'm a working artist and I can only divide myself up so much. But right now we have these private chats. So we have this chat um, where Denise is asking me about her Facebook ads and we've been trying to work through getting her some momentum. Um, and then the private area for the video chat, which the course hasn't started. So there's not a whole lot of chatting in here. And there'll be more spaces in here as we develop the need. And then the launch pad is gonna come once we get enough people in the course so that we can launch off of each other. So that's what the Discord looks like. When you join the Discord, the first thing you'll do is you'll come here and you'll verify that you're a real person because there are bots and there are malicious actors and basically the computer programs that would come and disrupt this Discord wouldn't be able to figure this out. So you have to go click on this and then everything else will appear to you. Then you're gonna to go to the public critique channel or no, you're gonna to go to the choose your role and you're gonna choose you know, whether you're a photographer, digital artist, painter, and this will give you certain roles. So if I come up with certain opportunities like a, a curated thing that's happening on one blockchain and it's like uh, photography looking for photographs of the sun. So I'll put a post in here, tag everyone who says they're a photographer and they'll have an opportunity to participate 
and maybe um, get into whatever curated event that is. So this is the Discord. And then as an example of having a personal Discord, here is mine. So there's 600 in people in here, 130 of them are collectors. There's uh, my chat with everyone and then um, links to different drops of mine. So different bodies of work. Silence. Luann just dropped a, a thing in here. She says, um, links to find out more about me. Yeah, so there's my Twitter. The About page has my TED Talk. It has my resume. So you guys can check that out and see who is actually going to help you with this stuff if you join. Um, so you guys can save those links or screenshot them and check them out. And then the, the Discord has public channels, so you can join that as well. I'm gonna give it about two minutes, I think, and then I'm gonna pop off. If you guys have more questions in the next hour or two, you can join the Discord again, the link is right there, and you can ask in the public channel. And um, the show gets started on next Monday. Did you have a question in the bottom there? Um, I don't have a name for you, it just says Zoom user, but I saw you just popped up on video, so I figured I'd ask. Joe, you're welcome, I'm glad you could, get some value out of this. <laughs> what are the main ways to tell a scammer from a real collector? If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, a real collector is not going to show up in your inbox asking you to mint something unless they already know you and you've had a conversation already. Um, a real collector is, is not gonna ask you to give them money. Like one of the old school scams is, can you get, they, they'll ask you for some small amount of money so that they can close a trade or something and then they will yeah, bail on you basically, or use that to ask you for more money. And um, you know, those are scams. So those are two things. Christian, you can email me. Um, I'm down to listen. Mary, how many times have you listened to this before it started making sense? I'm interested as a, as a data point for new artists coming in. Oh, she might have left. But yeah, I know some people have to listen to it a few times. When I got started, there was nobody to teach anything, of course. So um, it took a while for it to make sense to me too. And I just kind of had to keep like banging my head against it until something made it through my skull. Yeah, I've um, listened to, you know, the listened several times and also, you know, your videos um, have been really helpful. I, you know, I am getting a lot out of, um, TASA. So, um, you know, but, you know, for me to, to kind of put the pieces together here, I do have to listen several times um, to, you know, for me, for it to make sense to me. So, yeah, the course is really well, well worth it. And Discord was a little bit tricky to figure out. Um, but whoever's handling that, I don't know if it's Luann, whoever, um, whoever's um, being the admin there has been real helpful to to. Yeah, Luann's awesome. Uh, she, Luann's like one of my oldest friends. Um, I met her when I was stationed in Alaska in like 2006. But I'm not that, like I, I'm I'm trying to be nice, but sometimes I just don't have the patience for like tapping out Discord answers or, or repeating <laughs> questions. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you can always you can always picture a smile on her face when she's working with you guys. So thank you. Yeah, she's Luann. been very good. And, and your class is really good. Your course is really good here. Thanks. Yeah. Will I email this recording to all of you to download? No, um, that would be really hard. But I think what I'm going to do is put this on on uh, YouTube, this one. There is already 
the last webinar I gave is already in your inbox. So if you signed up for the original webinar, that's in your inbox for you to re watch the replay. And it's going to be available until Saturday. Uh, but I might put this on YouTube, I think. That might be what, what I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, I'm going to go. You guys, some of you know I'm not a fan of long goodbyes. So um, I will see you guys in a minute. I'm going to take a gaming break, and then I'll be back in the Discord to answer any questions that you guys have. Bye.